Hello and welcome back to Ordinary Differential Equations, the video series where we talk about how solutions of differential equations look like. And in today's part 26 we will see that for two-dimensional linear systems of ODEs. Indeed, the big advantage of the linear case is that we can explicitly write down the solutions. But as always before we do that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget that you can download a lot of additional material with the link in the description. Ok, then let's immediately start with what we already know about systems of linear ODEs which are autonomous and also homogeneous. First we have the explicit formulation where we have x dot is equal to ax where a is an n times n real matrix. So this means the whole ODE lives in the real numbers. And now what we have already shown in part 19 is that the solution space of this system is an n-dimensional vector space. And there the name we have chosen for the solution space was S0. So no matter how the matrix A is given, the dimension of the solution space is always equal to the size of the system. And moreover, we have also already shown that the columns of the matrix exponential span this solution space. So this means every column seen as a function of t gives us a solution of the original system. And all these solutions are linearly independent, so the columns span S0. So this means we don't need to explicitly calculate the matrix exponential, we just need to know what the columns can span. So this means if we multiply our matrix exponential by an invertible matrix C from the right hand side, then we get different combinations of the columns but we don't change what they span. So we don't change our solution space as 0 and please note here it's important that we have an invertible matrix and it's multiplied from the right hand side. This fact is really helpful as we will see now with our two dimensional cases. This means from now on we just consider a 2 times 2 matrix A. And indeed I would say if you have understood what can happen in this 2 dimensional case, then you also know what can happen in the n dimensional case. However, of course this 2 dimensional case is really tidy, which we can immediately see in the characteristic polynomial. It's a quadratic polynomial with two zeros and they could be different or they could coincide. And there we already have the two cases, either we have two different eigenvalues or only one. And indeed these two cases already result in different matrix exponentials. However, this is not all because we can still subclassify the two cases even more. So for example, in the first case we could have real eigenvalues or complex eigenvalues. Indeed you already know even a matrix with real entries can have proper complex numbers as eigenvalues. However, for a 2 times 2 matrix it cannot happen that the two cases are mixed. So if one eigenvalue is not real, the other one also has to be not real. And therefore in the second case the single eigenvalue lambda definitely has to be a real number. Therefore in the second case we have a different subdivision. Namely, there we can distinguish if the matrix is still diagonalizable. Obviously in the first case here A is always diagonalizable because we have enough eigenvectors. However, in the case that there is only one eigenvalue, it can happen that the eigenspace is only one dimensional. And then the result is that the matrix A is not diagonalizable. So these are the four possibilities we can have for our matrix A and we will discuss them exactly in this order. In fact I would say our 1a case is definitely the easiest one because we have discussed it already a little bit. As already mentioned we know that our matrix A is diagonalizable which means we find a basis of eigenvectors. So u1 is an eigenvector associated to the eigenvalue lambda1 and u2 is an eigenvector associated to lambda2. And now these two vectors we can put into the columns of a matrix U. So this is our transformation matrix and we know it's invertible. And since the columns are eigenvectors it will transform A into a diagonal matrix. 
So more precisely, we have u inverse au, and this is a 2 times 2 diagonal matrix. And obviously, as always, we find our eigenvalues on the diagonal. Or equivalently, we can also push our matrix u and u inverse to the right hand side. Then we have a nice formula for the matrix A and no problem at all to calculate the matrix exponential. More concretely, in order to calculate e to the power t A, we just have to calculate the matrix exponential of the diagonal matrix. And there we know it's easy, it's just e to the power t lambda 1 and e to the power t lambda 2. Hence, we just have to multiply these three matrices and then the columns of the result span our solution space as zero. But as you can see, this formula is not the best because you definitely have to calculate this inverse of u. So in order to avoid that, we can just bring it to the left hand side. And then you see, on the left we have e to the power ta times the matrix u. And exactly this we mentioned at the beginning, the columns of this matrix also span our whole solution space. And now in fact, the right hand side of this formula is easy to calculate. The first column is just e to the power t lambda 1 times u1. And the second column looks similar, just with lambda 2 and u2. So there we have it, these are the two columns and they span the whole solution set. Or in other words, you could say this is one solution and this is another solution and every linear combination is also a solution. So there we have it, our case 1a is done. And here please note, the crucial part we had in this first case was that all the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are real valued. So no complex numbers at all are needed to do the calculation. And this thing changes now in the 1b case because there complex numbers are needed for the diagonalization. In particular, we could do the same calculation as before, but we have to use complex numbers in each step. Although this helps in the calculation, it's not really helpful for the solution because we don't want to have complex valued solutions, but real valued solutions. In fact, we already know that if we stay in the real numbers, we still get a two-dimensional solution space out. Therefore, the question is, how can we do that if we are not allowed to use our nice diagonalization as before? And I can already tell you, the first part that helps you there is that we already know that both eigenvalues are connected. This is the case because the characteristic polynomial we consider only has real numbers as coefficients. This means if lambda 1 is a zero of this characteristic polynomial, we can definitely write it as alpha plus i beta. And then we can look at the complex conjugate of this number, which is alpha minus i beta. And now it turns out that this number also has to be a zero of the characteristic polynomial. So in other words, the complex conjugate of lambda 1 is exactly lambda 2. And of course this helps us a lot because the two complex zeros or the two complex eigenvalues essentially break down to two real numbers alpha and beta. And a similar thing holds for the corresponding eigenvectors, namely we could choose u1 as an eigenvector for lambda 1. So it's a vector in C2, so we also need complex numbers and we can write it as u plus iv where u and v are real vectors. Moreover, also there, you can simply check if we define the vector u2 as u minus iv, then we get an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda 2. So as before, these eigenvectors form a basis, but now of C2, and they can be used to do the diagonalization as before, but this will be a complex diagonalization. However, now it turns out that there is also a substitute for that, that only uses real numbers. It's not an actual diagonalization, but for our purposes it's good enough. So again, let's use an invertible matrix, which we now call u tilde. And now this matrix u tilde transforms A into a matrix that only has alpha and beta as entries. In particular, we have the real part alpha on the diagonal and the imaginary part beta here and there. And also the matrix u tilde is not complicated at all, 
it just uses the two eigenvectors from before. However, also only the real and the imaginary part. So we have u in the first column and v in the second column. Indeed, you can just check and calculate that everything works here. This is not hard at all, but the essential result we have is that we can write it down by only using real numbers. This means we can completely redo this transformation for the matrix exponential as well. Obviously also e to the power ta is a matrix which is not diagonalizable over the real numbers. Indeed, we already know the eigenvalues are e to the power t lambda 1 and e to the power t lambda 2. And there we can just use our Euler formula to use cosine and sine functions. Of course, e to the power t alpha stays like that, but the beta part goes to cosine of beta times t plus i sine of beta times t. And since we only have the minus sign for lambda 2 as a difference, we also only get a minus sign here for the second eigenvalue. So for the second eigenvalue of our matrix exponential, we have cosine of beta t minus i sine of beta t. And the eigenvectors stay the same, so we can use the same u1 and u2 and the same transformation matrix u tilde. So we can also transform our matrix exponential into the normal form we have. The only difference is now that the entries are given by our new eigenvalues. So again, we have a real part we put on the diagonal and an imaginary part we put off diagonal. So for example, the first entry is simply e to the power t alpha times cosine of beta t. And please don't forget the minus sign we always have outside of the diagonal. So you directly see we can take out our e to the power t alpha and the whole thing is immediately more compact. And moreover, we can also multiply our inverse of u tilde to the right hand side to get rid of the inverse. So we are almost done we just have a matrix multiplication on the right hand side. So please recall, the left hand side already tells us that the columns of the result span the whole solution space. And most importantly, you should recognize no complex numbers are involved at all. So as a last step, let's calculate this matrix product. The first column gives us cosine times u minus sine times v. So this is a whole vector as a column and multiplied with e to the power t alpha, it gives us a solution of our system of ODEs. So you can remember the cosine and psi functions are involved because our eigenvalues from the original matrix A were proper complex. And finally, our second solution here looks similar, but we have a plus sign and the roles of u and v are exchanged. And that's it. These two columns multiplied with e to the power t alpha span the whole solution set. Indeed, it's the two-dimensional real solution space. And what goes in here is the real part and the imaginary part of our original eigenvalue and the real and the imaginary part of our eigenvector. And because of that, we don't have any complex numbers involved at all. Okay, I think this was a really interesting case and now we can go to the case A2, which only has one eigenvalue. Despite that, we still find enough eigenvectors to properly diagonalize A. Hence, this works more or less the same as case 1A. So we can just copy that we have a basis of eigenvectors, which we can put into a matrix U. And now the only difference to our case 1A is that on the diagonal of the diagonal matrix, we find the same number. And this also implies that our matrix exponential also only has one eigenvalue. But obviously this is not a big problem because the eigenvectors are still linearly independent. So they still span a two-dimensional subspace, which is our solution space. So you see this case is already done and we can immediately jump to 2b. So now we are not diagonalizable, which means we don't find a basis of eigenvectors. But as you should know from linear algebra and the Jordan normal form is that we can still construct a basis with generalized eigenvectors. So in this case, u1 is an ordinary eigenvector and u2 is a generalized eigenvector. And similarly to before, we can put this basis into a matrix 
which is invertible by definition, and this one gives us the Jordan normal form. So U inverse AU cannot be a diagonal matrix, but just a Jordan normal form. In the 2 times 2 case, this is not really complicated, because we just have a 1 here above the diagonal. This is a really simple Jordan normal form, because we just have one Jordan block and one Jordan box. And as you might remember, we can always split it up into two parts, where one is diagonal and the other one nilpotent. So the one part we call D for diagonal and the other one N for nilpotent. And please note, the nilpotent condition is really easy to justify, because N squared is already the zero matrix. And now you already know, the Jordan normal form is all we need to actually calculate our matrix exponential. Namely, we have the same transformation for the matrix exponential as we have it for our original matrix A. And then we just need to calculate the matrix exponential of D plus N. And since these parts commute, we can just split it up into a product of matrix exponentials. And now you know this is quite easy, because we just have a diagonal matrix as a matrix exponential and a nilpotent one. This means the first factor is the same as we had before, so the eigenvalue in the exponential function. And the second one is a finite series that starts with the identity matrix. And because we are in a 2 times 2 case, we know we already have to stop with the linear term, because n squared is equal to 0. But please note, in a higher dimensional case, the sum here can definitely be longer. Ok, so now we just have to multiply the matrices and put them together again, and what we get is that we can pull out the factor e to the power t lambda. And what remains in the matrix is simply the diagonal part with 1s, and off diagonal we have a t here. So that's already the whole calculation, and you know as before, the only thing that remains to do is to put this inverse to the right hand side as well. So this means, now we have to multiply the matrix U with this new matrix. And this is not hard at all, and we immediately see how the columns look like. Namely, the first column is just our eigenvector U1, and then the second column has U1 with a T in front, but also plus our generalized eigenvector U2. And that's it, these are our two columns, that span the whole two-dimensional solution space. But please don't forget, we also have to multiply with the factor e to the power t lambda. And this finishes our discussion, now we have the whole solution theory for linear systems in two dimensions. The only restriction is that we have a homogeneous and an autonomous system. However, for this linear case, now you have learned, if you know the correct properties of the matrix A, you can write down the solution space. So there are no other surprises in the two-dimensional case at all. Which also means that we can use this knowledge for second-order ODEs. However, this is definitely something we should discuss in the next video. So I really hope I meet you there again, and have a nice day. Bye bye.